Welcome and hello. Uh, I'm Ellie Noam from Columbia, uh, speaking to you from Connecticut. Uh, Bill Drake is speaking to you also at Columbia, speaking to you from New Jersey, right? Um, and Eddie. and uh, uh, also co-conspirator is uh, Jason Buckweitz, who is uh, uh, running the show uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you. Uh, so the issue today is the uh, WTO uh, negotiation in uh, Abu Dhabi that uh, just concluded a few weeks ago. Um, and for those of you who are um, not following trade negotiations, in other words, normal people, sane people, um, uh, the 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 particular this particular round, the ministerial round, uh, uh, was disappointing. Disappointing to those people in particular who expect something. Um, so the greatest success apparently was to a to have had a final statement, um, and secondly to have been joined by Timor and Comoros, two great nations. Uh, I mean, uh, small nations. Um, the um, the uh, but there was there was certainly one important thing. There were several things that were being discussed, and discussion itself is a positive thing. So don't get me wrong; it doesn't have to be the bottom line. Uh, but there was not much agreement. But one of it, one of the agreed issues, was a kind of non-agreement. Uh, uh, the agreement was to continue the moratorium for another two years. Moratorium on taxation of uh, e-commerce type transactions, um, and and so so uh, will that will be kind of the main topic that we will talk about. But the question really is kind of this WTO process as a whole. Uh, it doesn't seem to be agreeing on anything, and that is not because people are of ill will per se, but rather it is structural. First, the WTO as it works works by consensus, which is a nice way of saying is that virtually every country can have a veto. Um, uh, there are some attempts to uh, to to create this kind of block type uh, possibilities of not multilateral but plurilateral type agreements. Uh, but that too has been apparently blocked. We will hear about this a little later. Um, and so so the question really is what can the WTO really do here? Uh, because basically if you look at the it, it overall, um, it cannot agree on hardly anything because there's so many countries and so many different interests. And so in agriculture, in fisheries, in labor relations, on, on any topic. Secondly, uh, whatever rules exist get violated left and right. And there is no agreement on enforcement mechanism or dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, and, but, to, uh, but to add insult to injury, even though there's no agreements and those agreements that exist get violated, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference uh, because international global trade keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and so the question really is then what is its function? The WTO successor of the GATT uh, kind of arose in a period in which free trade was run ran, uh, high in estimate uh, and and uh, the the Soviet bloc had just collapsed. Uh, China had not yet achieved a global position, and so kind of everybody was around a free trade position championed by the United States. But now, even in this particular round, even the United States have not really come out anymore as a leader for free trade. Uh, and the question is that we had discussed in an earlier. Um, session uh, uh, organized and shared by Bill is why did the U.S. kind of retreat uh, from a leadership in free trade? Is it because of anti-China? Uh, is it because uh, is it pro-labor? Uh, is it because of an anti-tech sentiment in Washington, um, or is it pro-environment? Or whatever the kind of the factors are that has kind of changed the U.S. position. And in the absence of U.S. leadership on free trade, uh, we know that free trade is not going to go very far, uh, uh, at least not globally. And so then the question is whether some smaller groupings uh, will emerge because some agreements are necessary, but not necessarily these kind of global ones. Um, there could be within blocks like the European Union. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, or with the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things that are important. Uh, and within that, the digital trade is particularly important, I think, because digital trade, uh, which was not taxed, which was free flowing, uh, relatively speaking, has increasingly kind of been beleaguered, not necessarily by tariff rules, but by quasi tariff rules like the various EU provisions and domestic locations and uh, processing and domestic quotas and productions, et cetera, and fines on American particularly American uh, companies. And so if you add it all together, free trade in digital type activities has already been uh, shrinking considerably. <coughs> As countries have also um, understood, not it's not only an issue of sovereignty and domestic policy, but as countries have also recognized that these big tech companies, mostly American, are a very rich source of revenue Europeans have been there first, uh, but now the rest of the world kind of sees that this is a kind of there are some cash cows, and those cash cows can be uh, uh, brought in for revenue. And who, uh, what country does not need more revenues? So this is basically the situation. Uh, and now, as to the specifics of digital trade, uh, we have a wonderful session with wonderful speakers. Thank you very much, Bill. And you can uh, please uh, take it from here. All right, Ellie, uh, thank you uh, for that introduction, interesting views. Uh, so welcome everybody, and thanks for joining this month's installment of this seminar series on global digital governance. Um, we've covered a wide range of topics since launching last year, and the videos and transcripts of the previous sessions are on the website uh, that's included in the announcement for this event. Our next meeting will be uh, four weeks from today, uh, Tuesday, April 16th. And we'll discuss the zero draft of the UN's Global Digital Compact, uh, which is due for release at the end of March. So uh, to today's topic uh, that Ellie was just speaking to, uh, trade, uh, digital trade. Uh, the importance of trade policy to global internet governance and digital governance is not always widely appreciated. Um, we kind of have two silos out there that don't connect very well. The communities of expertise and practice around trade and the one around internet uh, governance and digital issues, often there's not a lot of really serious sustained interaction. Uh, people in the multi-stakeholder internet world tend to think of the trade world as kind of opaque and controversial and not part of our remit to deal with it. And the trade community, of course, has this kind of traditional attitude of, you know, we got this. Uh, we'll, we'll do closed door discussions uh, behind, behind uh, you know, a shield uh, that nobody can see over uh, and multi-stakeholder support and internet expertise are not really needed. Um, but nevertheless, you know, binding trade rules governing commerce over networks, including the internet, are clearly internet governance as defined by the United Nations and related processes, and obviously integral to broader global digital governance. So we wanna help to bridge the gap between these silos. Um, it's worth remembering because a lot of the press coverage that talks about this stuff um, often is ahistorical, that the WTO's engagement in the digital space is not new. Uh, it goes back to 1994 with the negotiation of the General Agreement on Trade and Services, which was a, a huge treaty framework that directly addresses telecom networks and services as a sector in their own right, and also as a mode of supply for the electronic trans uh, transactions in other services sectors like finance and banking, et cetera. And it establishes uh, national commitments, liberalizing a great deal of trade services over electronic networks and other means. And then the WTO's GATS agreement was extended in 1997 by a big negotiation and deal over basic telecommunications that extended liberalization deep into the telecom world. And over 120 countries have made commitments on that since then. So, you know, and WTO has been involved in a lot of different aspects of the digital environments with uh, intellectual property issues and trade facilitation, uh, information technology agreements and so on. But the rise of the internet as an integrative infrastructure for the digital economy has really presented challenges for the WTO that go beyond the issues that were raised by the corporate networks that were the focus of cross-border supply of services back when the gas was negotiated. <clears throat> and in 1998, the WTO launched a big uh, work program on e-commerce that's dragged on for 25 years with fairly little progress trying to figure out uh, whether new disciplines are required 
or how do the old ones really apply um, to uh, the internet environment? And a lot of governments have wanted to slow walk these issues to avoid uh, any movement towards uh, negotiations in a space where they feel like they, they don't have competitive advantage uh, or, or won't really benefit from the outcomes. So, and along the way, importantly, a lot of uh, key countries like China have said that their commitments under the GATS on computer services and so on uh, don't apply to the new kind of environment of the internet and digital platforms, data flows and so on. So in consequence, uh, digital trade barriers have grown like topsy in recent years, unconstrained by WTO disciplines and efforts to try to respond to these, as Ellie indicated, have sort of moved out of the multilateral universal framework into a, a wide variety of varying coalitions and like-minded uh, with different kinds of plurilateral free trade agreements and so on, resulting in sort of a complex spaghetti bowl of rules that don't always um, cohere very well. So there's been an effort to try to deal with that. Since 2017, in the ministerial meeting then, there were proposals to launch a new multilateral digital trade agenda, but there was a lot of pushback from developing countries in Africa, China, India, and so on. And so in the end, you had 71 countries that launched a kind of informal, uh, unofficial pre-negotiation called the Joint Statement Initiative, the JSI, about which we'll be talking about a lot today. And today there's over 90 countries involved in that, including China now. Um, and they've been having regular informal meetings trying to agree a negotiation text that could then be used for the exchange of concessions um, going forward. And they've covered a wide variety of, of digital governance issues from internet uh, openness and data flows, non-discrimination, liability for platforms, for, for transactions, consumer protection, privacy, cybersecurity, you name it, it's all in there. And the positions uh, have, have been sort of polarized a bit between the US historically pushing kind of a strong deal, the Europeans broadly supporting that, but with more limitations, privacy, et cetera. China pushing for a more minimalist uh, kind of thing that didn't really require them to make any changes in their domestic rules. Developing countries split between those who support digital trade negotiations and those who don't. And so it's been a very controversial process with uh, all kinds of splits between different groups, including within civil society. And then, as Ellie indicated, and as we talked about in our November webinar, the Biden administration threw a spanner in all the works in October uh, 2023, announcing in Geneva that it was withdrawing its longstanding proposals for hard commitments on cross-border data flows, forced data localization, forced disclosure of source code, non-discrimination, et cetera. And there's a lot of debate about why this has happened. It's sort of the rise of the Bidenistas, the anti-GAFAM, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren contingent to the Democratic Party within the administration, or is it because of techno-nationalism in China and the securitization of internet issues? A lot of different debates about that, but in any event, it's been a huge con controversy, and as you probably know, the Republicans in the Congress are now uh, launching investigations to try to demonize the staffers in the Biden administration who dared to talk to civil society activists. So a lot of stuff going on, but the ripples for that continue to expand. The G7 just released a ministerial declaration on digital that didn't mention cross-border data flows uh, for the first time in a decade. Uh, so the U.S. is just not clear what they're trying to do there. And the JSI negotiations are crawling along. Um, the leaked text from February that the chairs put together lack provisions across all the tough issues, data, data localization, data flows, source code, disclosure, non-discrimination platforms. So it seems like they're they're moving towards a kind of minimalist e-commerce facilitation deal, the kind of thing that China has been advocating for a long time. So where all this goes and what it means for the global digital economy are big issues. And we want to try and dig into that today. And to do it, we have an excellent panel of experts who've written extensively and run projects on digital trade. Uh, this is actually our first panel that's all academics. I'm not quite sure how that happened, uh, but <laughs> I'm happy that we have the folks we do. Uh, we have uh, joining us from Switzerland, Mira Buri. Uh, Mira is professor of international economics and internet law at the University of Lucerne. She's also the principal investigator of the Trade Law 4.0 project. And she was previously a senior fellow at the World Trade Institute at the University of Bern. 
Anupam Chander is the Ginsburg Professor of Law and Technology at Georgetown Law School in Washington, DC. He was previously the director of the California International Law Center and the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis. And Martina Farrakhan is a research fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and an academic manager of the Digital Trade Integration Project, who's very involved in working with uh, international organizations and other actors on these issues. So she's joining us from Italy. So um, that's our group, and we're looking forward to a robust conversation. As always, we'll do tour de tabs around a few uh, questions we, we want to discuss, and then at the top of the hour, open it up to discussion. And I see a lot of people in the room, so I'm hoping that we can have a good, robust debate on all these issues. So let's start then uh, with questions to the panel. Um, and I think it'd probably be good to start with the, the, the broad context before we dive into negotiations. Before we drill down into what's going on in the JSI, et cetera, what's, what's the current state of play in your view in terms of the international trade order with regard to digital trade? Uh, in the absence of any existing framework, uh, bespoke framework right now, what kind of trends are we seeing with regard to national restrictions, techno-nationalist policies, et cetera? And how does this affect the, the global digital economy? Um, in other words, what's the demand for international uh, uh, agreements here? Uh, why don't we just go in alphabetical order, maybe Mira and then Anupam and, and Martina, like that. So go ahead, Mira. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the invitation and for getting this round of experts, um, all friends uh, that I know quite well. Uh, so um, first, with regard to the digital trade rulemaking landscape, um, it is quite clear that we see more and more rules that are adopted in different forums, um, not necessarily in the multilateral WTO forum, as you mentioned, as, as Ali mentioned, it is indeed in crisis, but we see this happening in bilateral and regional free trade agreements. Essentially all new free trade agreements have a digital trade or electronic commerce chapter very often with um, substantive and important rules that are trying, of course, to reduce these non-tariff barriers. But not only that, so it's not only about sort of market access, it's really about sort of providing um, interoperability between domestic regimes on some important um, issues. Uh, those include some of the sort of the trade facilitation issues that you mentioned, which are not unimportant, I would argue later on, like uh, electronic signatures, paperless trading, et cetera, but also things in the broader domain of data governance, uh, where we see rules on data flows. We do have about 45 agreements that have rules on cross-border data flows. Some of them are completely liberal. Most of them are sort of conditional. We see rules on cybersecurity as well as you know privacy protection. So in a sense, not only do we see the emergence of this distinct tailored digital trade law regime, but also these new agreements have sort of a gravitational pull in the sense that a lot of issues, non-trade issues in a sense, get regulated in this uh, digital trade um, agreements. And we also see legal innovation. So there is some, some sort of optimism there that should be highlighted as well with the emergence of the digital economy agreements. You know, we have five so far mostly actually sort of um, pioneered by Singapore. So we also see changing geopolitics, the dynamics are changing. So the US is somehow retiring from its sort of um, driving force in this uh, sort of domain. And we see new players coming forward uh, like Singapore, as I mentioned. So I, I would not say that it is so negative. Actually, I see the the sort of the domain of digital trade law slash regulation as one where we see international cooperation. It is still fragmented, and that is, of course, a minus, but there is a will across different governments and across different governments that have different understandings of the issues to actually cooperate in order to reduce our trade barriers and to enable this sort of global data-driven economy. There are a lot of contestations, and I'm sure we're going to touch upon those sort of fields, uh, contested fields later on, but I, I will leave it at this um, at this point in time. Great. Thanks, Mira. That's a good start for us. Uh, Anupam, any thoughts about data nationalism and other kinds of things you thought about before? Um, 
So we are very much uh, in a moment of data nationalism. Um, the United States is caught up in data nationalism after having spent decades decrying data nationalism. Uh, so uh, there's been a reversal of positions. Uh, the uh, I was looking at RCEP versus uh, the JSI proposal right now. And the RCEP, which includes China, uh, includes some data, data localization uh, bars. Um, of course, they're not actually enforceable through the dispute settlement process, but there's a greater commitment to avoid data localization that China has undertaken through RCEP uh, than we are willing to undertake today, apparently. Uh, so uh, so it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, position that the United States has found itself in. Um, and uh, kind of uh, unusual, normally the trade positions of a country reflect the economic interests of that country. Um, and here, it's not clear that the economic interests of the United States are represented in those negotiations. Um, and so, uh, so that's fascinating. Now, the argument, and I'll just quickly just, the argument is that data flow or other liberalization positions undermine domestic regulation. Um, and, and Mira hinted at that as to, about the, the scope of digital trade today. Uh, it encroaches lots of different domains. Um, but really the question that trade law asks is, are you discriminating against a foreign provider uh, inappropriately? Um, and so that's the main question. And so it looks very much like nationalism, like protectionism, where countries do not want to be challenged, uh, to have their rules challenged on discrimination grounds. And we can put, set aside national security. I can come back to that. That's what I've been devoting my last couple of years to, last three years of my work to, uh, which is uh, opens up a whole host of other issues. But, but uh, let's leave it at that. Uh, so right now, the US retreating, I think largely on the theory that liberalization commitments undermine its own ability to regulate big tech. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate view of the matter. Uh, you just need to make sure that you regulate all tech the same way and that you're not discriminating against uh, you know, particular uh, country, uh, companies from particular countries. Uh, the U.S. Trade Representative has no mandate to do antitrust at the domestic level, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Anyway, all right, great. Thanks, uh, NFM. Uh, Marty. Yeah, thanks. Um, perhaps just building on what Tanubam was, was saying, um, I think uh, that the fact that uh, China is, had just tabled its uh, language on data commitments um, before the U.S. Uh, made this announcement about withdrawing, I think is not a coincidence. It's really it seems that now China is more willing to take commitments on data flows than the U.S. And it is very sad uh, because we are we are going to miss uh, the leadership role that the U.S. had. Um, and I think this is bad news for trade, but also bad, new, bad news for internet governance more generally. Um, and I will argue that when it comes to the um, to internet governance, the interests of uh, the, the the agenda on digital trade aligns very well with the general. Uh, interest on on intergovernance, especially when it comes to having a free flow of data and they making sure that uh, uh, the internet is not weaponized or controlled uh, by states. So I, I think it's like the, the the landscape is not very optimistic on that front. And um, just adding, um, given as you were talking about what's what's going on and the policies, um, we it, uh, at the UI we're doing this project on tracking uh, regulation on digital trade. And what we are seeing is that clearly there are more and more policies. And what is interesting is that we don't only see more uh, restrictive policies similar to, to what we saw before in terms of like purely protectionist policies um, that uh, could be um, requirements to keep data locally, uh, requirements to, co to establish uh, commercial in the country or restrictions on, on investment, 
uh, but we also see uh, uh, all new type of policies that are justified by security rationale. So all these screenings of investment or goods uh, that are coming up and also policies which are aimed at controlling uh, the digital space also domestically. So this new rise of governments against its own companies to have more access to, for example, source code or uh, managing AI uh, developments. So all of this together uh, creates an environment which is uh, very fragmented and yeah, and which will be very hard to, um, to work in for, for companies in the future. Thanks, Marty. That, that's great. All right. So then let's start to get into the negotiation stuff. So we, as Ellie uh, mentioned, and as I did too, we just had the 13th ministerial meeting of the WTO uh, in the UAE, and it was generally regarded as not terribly successful. But with regard to um, uh, digital trade, a couple of things happened. One was that they agreed to extend the Sleepy Work Program uh, on e-commerce until 2026. But the big thing that got most of the attention was this debate over the moratorium on customs duties. Now, uh, this was agreed in 1998 that states would continue their practice of not imposing customs duties on electronic transmissions. And the question of how, what that means exactly to impose a duty on a transmission is an interesting one. And this has been renewed every two years, but it's been highly controversial. Um, and uh, several countries led by India, South Africa, and Indonesia have been arguing uh, strenuously for ending this uh, moratorium. They want, they say, that they're losing uh, tariff revenue uh, because uh, things that used to be sent across borders in physical form where they could apply uh, customs duties at the border, now we're coming in digital form. So they want to be able to impose a customs duty on pit streams uh, somehow. And uh, they're losing revenue and they're getting support in this thinking from UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, doing studies saying you're losing all this money, et cetera. So this is a huge battle. And uh, this preoccupied much of the uh, digital trade uh, space for the past year. Um, and in the end of the day, they only managed to extend the moratorium in the very last uh, hour of the negotiations uh, when the uh, chair made a big plea to the members to agree to it. So uh, some thoughts maybe from, from you all about what happened at the, the ministerial, in particular, this customs duty thing. I mean, what are the issues? Why, why and how do states want to apply customs duties on digital bit streams? Could, if we could maybe give some people, because for people from the internet world, that might sound really bizarre. So uh, Mira, could you maybe help us with that? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so the scope of the customs moratorium was never really clear. And there was a bit of a discussion on this. You know, to what extent it covers only the electronic transmissions or it's sort of the bits that fall uh, flow, or it covers also the content. So also if you have a video or a song, that would cover that as well. So this is not clarified yet, and there are different discussions. What the OECD did, however, is to show uh, is that no matter uh, what definition applies as to the scope of the moratorium, uh, the impact of um, actually not having it, of applying certain duties, is going to be minimal in the sense that it's not going to generate a lot of revenue for those countries that are you know, willing to, to cut this moratorium, uh, such as India and Indonesia, as, as you mentioned. And uh, what is important here is that you can still apply sort of digital taxes. So you can still have VATs and digital tax um, applying what is different with the customs uh, duties um, uh, on electronic transmissions is that they will be discriminatory. So they will be discriminating between incoming and sort of domestic um, you know, services that are offered. So um, I'm, I'm very glad that the moratorium was um, you know, um, extended. It was already controversial during the, the last ministerial conference. What is interesting now and is quite different from the decision at the NC12 is that they now extend it for another two years, but they also say that the work program is going to expire on that day. So that is that is a huge difference and it's very much in contrast to all the papers, all the discussions that were submitted uh, before MC13 where everyone was really highlighting the importance of working together, 
uh, under the work program on electronic commerce, the importance of, of inclusiveness in support of developing countries. So I was a little bit struck by this and also a little bit surprised that they also say, well, the work program is going to be finalized as well. So let me pick up from Mira, um, which is a fantastic description. Um, just uh, to kind of contextualize it even further, if you go back to the 1990s and before, um, when CDs and DVDs came in, uh, of, you know, to a country, uh, many developing countries and, and others uh, had customs duties on those uh, on those movies, on those music, uh, uh, even books that would be coming into the country. So they'd be stopped at the border, they'd be assessed their customs duty, and um, and many developing countries don't have a very significant income tax base. They rely more heavily on customs as a percentage of their uh, government revenues than, than the United States certainly does. Uh, so so this is a uh, so you can understand then the countries were hey, look, we used to get this revenue stream when things came, when movies and uh, music came in um, over uh, the, the sea, uh, but now we can't get it when it comes in over the ether. Um, and that's, that's I, I, there's, as Mira says, what, what the, uh, there is a workaround that is readily available, which is you can tax uh, you know, uh, you can have a Netflix type tax, you can tax Netflix or other videos, but you just have to assess it on domestic providers, just like foreign providers. This is, again, that anti-discrimination norm that I was talking about earlier, which is central to this. Um, as long as you do that, you can still earn revenues uh, to the government for music and videos circulated locally on the internet. So I, I think that's the, there, you know, uh, the, I don't know why they don't move to that model. Uh, maybe that the domestic providers of these services do not want to pay those kind of taxes. And I think that's the only explanation that I can see, but I'm not sure why that, that isn't a pretty simple solution to the problem. Thanks. Marty? Yeah, um, so on this, I think that um, uh, indeed there is a lot of uh, lack of understanding uh, yet and uh, developing countries are asking to understand better uh, what are the implications of this uh, commitment and that's why they have not yet committed to a permanent moratorium. Uh, but I think there is uh, some openness, especially after the study uh, that you were mentioning from the IMF, WTO, UNCTAD all together, that was qu made quite a compelling argument about the more efficient uh, approach of using VAT instead of tariffs. Um, now, as, as Anuba was saying, uh, we... They, we don't know why uh, developing countries are still not going in the direction, but one um, explanation is also the lack of um, uh, po possibility or capability to enforce domestically such such a regulation. Um, we'll see how that moves forward. Uh, but I think um, the developing countries in the WTO that have traditionally opposed uh, the moratorium have asked for more studies and more technical discussion on this issue. So I think we will see more developments uh, in the next months, especially because this is also part of the GSI. So um, they need to um, agree uh, pretty soon. Um, and just about what that means, um, it, it's quite um, interesting to, to think about the consequences of uh, the lack of this moratorium. Uh, because Indonesia has been the only country so far that has uh, changed its um, 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 tariff lines to include also um, the transmissions. Uh, they have included software and different types of software that they could decide to start tariff, uh, imposes, imposing tariffs on. Uh, but electronic transmissions means virtually anything. It could be any service. It could be newspapers. It could be online games. It could be uh, 3D models that then are 3D printed. So it could it could mean data. But they just so the countries could decide to this, to to tax data when it just flows into the country. So it's potentially a Pandora box that could lead countries to implement very weird policies with the objective to extract revenue in a way from foreign uh, 
companies with potential uh, negative consequences, not only on consumers, because you increase costs, so that's how also tariffs usually work. You make things more expensive for your own consumers, but also a lot of these products, uh, especially software, are used as an intermediate um, product to then offer services for them by domestic companies. So it, it becomes also an increase of costs for domestic companies to offer the services in an efficient way, um, and therefore will have a negative impact on the economy, as some studies have shown already. Yeah, I want to pick up on something you just said, Martina, I mean, about it raises the cost domestically. I mean, just to be provocative, one could say, well, maybe this uh, the moratorium was really important in 1998 when the internet was first taking off. But these days, things have evolved a great deal further since then. You have this huge over-the-top OTT kind of uh, environment. And if countries uh, uh, try to apply uh, customs duties, uh, big companies uh, like Netflix, they'll just pass the cost along to the domestic consumer, in which case it's just basically you're just, it's just going to raise the price for Indians and, and Indonesians and so on, uh, rather than, you know, disrupting big companies. So, I mean, it's interesting the way the politics around this are changing. I mean, I've seen some trade experts like Rob House uh, coming out and saying, let's get rid of it. Who cares anymore? You guys don't buy that argument? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that will be the consequence. Uh, if, if countries implemented such uh, tariffs at the border, in the way in which they like it's also very complicated to implement but if they did it uh, the consequence the, the increasing cost will be mostly for the local consumers and for local companies that are using these services to then develop uh, their own services um all all these companies especially in developing countries are relying heavily on uh, pro cloud computing services or, or just softwares uh, to develop their own services upon. So if you implement such a, a tariff, you're basically also implementing an extra uh, tax on your companies and your consumers. Yeah. Either you have the two want to reply to that or should we move on? It's going to be also a huge uh, hit on, you know, like legal certainty, you know, like for businesses, um, it's going to change completely the environment. So uh, we were talking beforehand about sort of this regulatory fragmentation this again would would add another layer to this with with economic impact on different companies and potentially uh, on smaller enterprises rather than on the big ones. Yeah, it, it, this is definitely a bigger deal. The smaller the firm is, right? Big companies could probably figure out ways to raise their their prices, but for small firms that are engaged in a lot of different types of transmissions, it becomes more of a factor. And if I'm anything on this, or should I move on? No. All right. Well, then let's talk about the the JSI stuff uh, because this is the bit where the rubber meets the road. So this is the big deal. So you know, governments have been working on this negotiation since 2017, trying to come up with a framework to begin uh, actual negotiations, exchange of concessions, market access, and so on. And in trying to craft that text, they've been deeply divided on a lot, a lot of different important points. But then the you know, progress is moving a little bit, but then the Biden people backed out. So now we're in a different world, right? We've got a te draft text out there, which has been leaked, uh, which is the only way you can see a lot of this stuff in the WTO, which is ridiculous. Um, and it's you you see that there are certain issues where there's been some closure and the issues have been parked as being, okay, we can move forward with this. But those are mostly kind of like narrow technical issues like electronic signatures and, and so on which are, as Mira says, important, but not demanding on con countries in terms of changing their domestic policy frameworks. Um, but then all the key issues that the U.S. used to be pushing, which are the ones that the private sector really was interested in, barriers to cross-border data flows, uh, requirements for forced data localization that you have to retain or process the data within the country in order to operate in the market, uh, requirements that you must uh, open your source code to the government as a condition of market entry, uh, non-discrimination against uh, digital products and so on, uh, treatment of platforms, et cetera. All that stuff has been put aside. So how do you folks read where the negotiations are and, and seem to be going given this new configuration? Uh, Mira, how about you, you start? Yeah, so a progress was made already uh, last year. So there is not a huge change in now this new round of negotiations that 
uh, was concluded just uh, last week, uh, at least when I compare the two sort of um, texts that we have, the negotiated uh, text. Um, something that is clear is all the bracketed test, uh, te texts on the issues that you mentioned have been removed. So all the sort of the, the data governance issues. Uh, but we do have uh, rules on, on privacy in addition, things like, uh, you know, cybersecurity cooperation, uh, open governmental data, and all those e-trade facilitation issues. And they did add uh, a few things on, on ICT products that use cryptography. So that is also quite important, you know, not to, um, um, it, it's a norm that normally um, existed next to the source code uh, norm um, in treaties like the USMCA. And there are some development issues that have been taken on board, which are trying to make sort of, uh, you know, digital trade rulemaking uh, more inclusive. So uh, overall, um, I think they made progress and they say they can conclude uh, already in summer. So I, I was actually positively surprised by this. I thought that negotiations are going to go uh, longer and maybe completed, um, be completed only, uh, only in the fall. Um, as to evaluating sort of the normative effect of these norms, I think it's pretty low uh, if you compare to frameworks that we have, you know, in this uh, regional and um, bilateral uh, trade agreements, which do include rules on data flows also for the United States, you know, coming from the US Japan digital trade agreement as well as from the US MCA. So the US too has uh, quite important commitments coming from those treaties that should not be underestimated. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's going to provide basically sort of a baseline, which I think is still a good thing, you know, like uh, providing certain legal certainty, as I mentioned, and basically cutting the red tape uh, on on many of those issues that I mentioned in the area of um, digital trade facilitation. So um, there are some good things uh, in the in the bucket, but um, basket, but a lot of the, these major things are missing and will be missing. So they then they will not be taken uh, back into the basket. Okay, that's an important point. Uh, thanks, Anna Pat. So when the JSI began, uh, the negotiations began, there was a real question as to how you could possibly have uh, the EU, the United States and China agree on uh, digital uh, issues. Um, and as Mira says, uh, it's actually remarkable that you see uh, a wide ag a range of agreement on some issues that are pressing forward. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, and uh, uh, But of course, the missing piece here is this uh, uh, data flows question. Uh, and so the localization of uh, computing facilities is no longer uh, uh, disfavored uh, in the leaked draft, though the November chairman's draft may still be the operative draft for for uh, for various purposes. So it's not clear. Uh, so there's a new leaked draft uh, just made available uh, or last uh, week or so. Um, and so so I think it's it's uh, you know it's it's interesting. It's also interesting, of course, that you know countries like South Africa and India have resisted. Uh, the JSI entirely, uh, and I'm still not persuaded that by their argument, uh, it still goes along that e-commerce moratorium. Uh, it's you know South Africa stands to be the you know the main e-commerce uh, you know platform in Africa generally, um, and uh, and India of course is a huge provider of digital services across the world. Uh, so it's, I've always been puzzled by their reluctance in this context. Yeah, important point. Martin. Maybe I can pick up this point from Anupam to, to give my explanation of why India and South Africa have this approach. Um, regarding India, it seems clearly that the domestic politics uh, is um, is blocking anything uh, because any decision that they will take will probably be used in their elections against them. Um, so it could explain uh, why, at least now in the last ministerial conference, there was no ambition from India at all, even on fisheries, which is something that India usually you would expect would support. Uh, for South Africa, my personal explanation of this, because I'm also thinking and, and trying to understand, 
uh, is that they, by um, preventing all African countries to interact with the rest of the world, but at the same time pushing domains regionally for openness, because in the African uh, free trade continental area, they have a completely different approach. They are basically securing their access to the, to the African market uh, without uh, uh, limiting uh, other foreign actors from entering Africa. So this could be an explanation. Um, and yeah, so just just on that, uh, um, for sure, we might see um, some movement this year. It seems, as, as Mira was saying, that they want to agree on the JI, on the GSI, and the final text. Uh, it will be much less ambitious than we would have hoped. And I think uh, the US is uh, to blame <laughs> mostly when it comes to data flows, for sure, because uh, it seems China had tabled a ling language on this. So China was willing to have a non-binding soft commitment, but it would have been much better than nothing at all. Uh, but they, with the US um, um, deciding to withdraw, basically there is no hope to have uh, data flows in, in the agreement anymore. Um, this is of course better than nothing to have this agreement. Uh, but uh, it also means that uh, there is huge space uh, for continued fra fragmentation uh, that as, as we have, have seen uh, so far. Um, one thing that Mira had mentioned before is that uh, in the ministerial conference, the uh, governments have committed also to um, end the work program on e-commerce. And I think that's, that's a very important development because uh, the work uh, program could have been a platform to continue this discussion. Um, after the GSI, but without having this platform, I wonder how will the WTO continue discussing these issues that for sure will not be solved uh, in, in two years. Yeah. Can, I, can I pick up on something Martina said? Uh, sure. Her explanation of South Africa's uh, negotiating position, both within the region of Africa and at the global or multilateral level um, through the GSI um, is is a credible one. It's the only thing that uh, tells a coherent narrative. Um, but it's an if that's the case, then it's both brilliant and cynical. Um, and it's it's it essentially what it does is it is it creates a tax on all African enterprise across the continent to promote South African enterprise. Um, and South Africa, I just want to remind you, is a upper middle income country. Um, and so if, you know, winner take all in Africa, it does not sound like a, a clever solution here. Thanks, Anna Pam. Well, let, let me try and pick up on this to, to provoke things a little bit. And this goes back to something both all of you uh, mentioned. You know, when, when the initial negotiations around JSO started, it was really kind of like a coalition of the like-minded, but then, and everybody decried the fact that, you know, China and certain uh, uh, countries had, uh, India had said that we're staying out of it. Then China came into it. And once they did, you have to ask, wonder, was there ever really a prospect for a strong multilateral trade agreement on digital uh, with the United States, China, and Europe as, as its three pillars, given how completely diverse, divergent their national policy frameworks are? I mean, I. In what world was China ever going to accept strong disciplines on, on cross-border data flows and data, data localization? I mean, you know, so, I mean, there are those people who would argue, I think, that really what the Biden people have done is just accepting reality and saying, you know, we were never going to get there anyway with these big ambitious points. So let's just stick to the minimalist framework ones, the, the technical kind of stuff that's needed to uh, facilitate trade where agreements have been reached bilaterally or plurilaterally, but to, don't expect the, the broad multilateral system to be a vehicle for promoting, uh, you know, significant change. And, you know, I mean, you've got the Biden administration now is using the language that developing countries always used of, you know, we need policy space, which is kind of interesting. So I just wonder, I mean, maybe this is just, one could argue, just to provoke in this, maybe it goes back to Ellie's point too, that this is simply a right-sizing of ambition, that there was no way the multilateral broad universal system was ever gonna have a shared comprehensive, strong digital trade framework anyway. What do you, what would be your response here? Yeah, well, I agree to, to some extent, uh, you know, it, 
we have all uh, written quite a bit on, you know, this very different models that the EU, the US and the China had with regard to data governance more broadly. So not only with regard to, to digital trade. So it's about a, the sort of the domestic and sort of the global dimension of it all. But, you know, that was, those were not static models. You know, they changed over time, of course, with the US making this very radical change, but also China changing its position over time, starting with RCEP and then, you know, wishing to uh, become a member of the CPTPP um, and also the DEPA, so, uh, so the, this Digital Economy Partnership Agreement between Singapore, um, uh, New Zealand and Chile. So, uh, and also domestically, the discourse has changed a lot. Um, they have realized, you know, that there is a, a lot of money to be made out of the digital economy of an open uh, digital economy. So there is, uh, I was just in November at a conference and it was all about digital trade and how they can benefit from it. And it was all about opening up at different levels of government um, in order to make this possible. So the discourse is, is still very much fluid. Um, the same with the European Union where, you know, from very early agreements, we had nothing on digital trade and certainly nothing on data flows in um, the preferential trade agreements of the European Union. And now with the one with the UK and with New Zealand, we do have rules on cross-border data flows, banning data localization measures, et cetera, uh, even things on source code. So I, I think the EU is actually a good example of showing how one can reconcile being relatively open in terms sort of, sort of conditional data flows and having a very, very robust framework for the uh, data economy or broadly the data society at home, so, you know, this overdrive almost in the EU of having more than, well, I don't know, 100 or uh, really enormous uh, amount of regulatory acts of deep regulatory interventions in the area of the digital economy. So the EU is the normative superpower. What do you think, Anna Pam? EU has been the normative superpower, there's no question. Um, and just picking up on Mira and just kind of restating what she said, just to make sure I've, you know, just uh, make sure everyone heard her, uh, you know, very clearly. Um, so the EU has uh, a public stance against data localization. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it, and you, Bill, you, you talk about policy space. The EU also has shown us, as Mira says, a very extensive data governance within the European Union as their regulatory superpower that he, that he described it, Bill. Um, so those turn out to be consistent with each other uh, in some way if the if the rules are framed in that way. Uh, now, um, I, I do worry a little bit about the EU's framing that sometimes allows uh, privacy to be excluded from any disciplines so that basically there's no uh, test for dis discrimination uh, available. Um, that can be problematic, but um, there is, uh, again, well-preserved policy space for regulating, creating data privacy. I want my privacy. Everyone here on this room in this uh, 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 webinar wants their privacy. Um, and the only question here is discrimination against uh, providers from abroad. And that's what trade is all about. Thus, this is why the, it, the kind of nexus between these questions and the international trade regime. Yeah. And that, that focus on non-discrimination gets lost in a lot of these discussions, unfortunately, especially the popular ones. Marty. Um, yeah, coming back to your question about whether there was hope at any point about uh, some substantive commitment in the JI, I think um, clearly no one had the expectation that these three huge powers would take binding commitment on very controversial issues. But at least we had some hope that there could be some sort of minimal non-binding commitment on some of these uh, issues. And at least... Um, Clearly, one thing is our, uh, aiming for harmonization, which will be very hard to achieve. Another thing is to aim for interoperability or some sort of collaboration in this area. So that would have been the ideal um, scenario, but it seems that even when it comes to finding ways to collaborate, these countries have not managed to uh, yeah, find a, a solution. 
and talking about privacy, I think privacy is an example of of how convergence can can happen in this area thanks to the the EU uh, pushing um, and having this uh, effect on the country. So it's definitely one area in which countries are starting to make commitments because they are harmonizing um, their uh, their regime. But we already had language uh, on on privacy in the WTO. We had a clear exception in guts uh, for for privacy exemptions. Um, but the the EU felt the need to create this uh, much more explicit um, extension of privacy from from the commitments, which could also be connected to the fact that the way in which the EU regulates privacy is not always uh, based on the um, following uh, MFN basis and 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 following a very transparent way of um, uh, providing uh, adequacy decisions. So you were also making a comment in the chat about adequacy and data localization. Um, yeah, I think if we assess uh, the adequacy from a trade perspective, we will find that the way in which adequacy decision is given is not really um, based on uh, MFN uh, basis and, and the EU is not giving the same treatment to all countries that have a similar model as the European Union. Absolutely not. All right, I want to open it up the, uh, the, the whole group in the, uh, five, five, four or five minutes, but just before we do it, just the last quick, quick round, then I want to ask then, given what we see, this trend towards a more minimalist uh, kind of agreement, would you expect then that we will see an increasing reliance on minilateral deals, free trade agreements, plurilateral deals outside the WTO framework, which would then, I would think, leave a lot of developing countries excluded from a lot of these trade deals. And you'd have just uh, partners, like-minded partners, very often industrialized countries forming deals. Is that the kind of world we're likely to go towards? And if so, what does that mean, in, especially for developing countries? Mira, just just quick. Yes, um, yeah, just very quickly. I, I agree that sort of this regulatory fragmentation is going to continue, is going to uh, deepen, um, and we're gonna see more sort of this development at different speeds at the same time. So um, while we, we had a sort of a graph that shows that, you know, all countries are basically negotiating with shift trade agreements, um, developing and developed, um, this is going to uh, get messier in a way. Um, however, uh, what I um, disagree a little bit with you um, is that developing countries will be somehow excluded from this digital trade to rulemaking processes. I do not think so. I mean, um, Martina mentioned before um, the, um, the digital protocol to the African continental trade area. We see the very dense framework that is also in development. So we're gonna, we have a very specific rule framework for digital trade. The same is true for the ASEAN countries, including developing as well as least developed countries that are negotiating currently a digital economy framework agreement, uh, also trying to create rules for uh, this region with regard to the digital economy as more broadly conceived and covering new issues as well, you know, such as uh, digital talent mobility uh, and digital um, uh, inclusion more broadly. So I, I think um, we're gonna see uh, in a way uh, expansion of the rules as to the topics that are covered because more and more topics become uh, relevant, but this is all going to be a sort of a messy process in a way. Thanks, Anna Pat. So I think that's, uh, you know, I think I'll just uh, echo what has been said. Um, you are seeing these regional moves. So I think that's important. The only thing I disagree with uh, on Mira, was she said all countries are negotiating FTAs. As far as I can tell, the U.S. has stopped negotiating FTAs. <laughs> so uh, all countries other than the United States are negotiating free trade agreements uh, at this point. So I'll leave it at that. After the election. Marty. Um, and well, yeah, uh, on my side, I think, uh, as Mira was saying, is we do see that there is anyway uh, this uh, this interest to continue discussion in, in this area. And, and that's a good thing, of course. It's better than, than nothing. Um, still, we are missing a, a very important platform for, 
for for discussion, which is the the WTO, which will be the ideal solution solution, the most efficient solution for sure, because the internet is one, but also the most effective solution at tackling non economic objective. It's like there is no. I think the WTO still remains the the best platform to to discuss these issues. Um, still, these uh, mini laterals and the discussion, for example, in digital economy agreements are a place where there could be this uh, sort of, as Mira calls it, legal entrepreneurship with new solutions that could be um, used uh, and uptaken in other agreements, in other contexts. Uh, and when it comes to leaving behind the developing uh, countries, I think that when it comes to digital trade, we have some developing countries showing a lot of uh, leadership and interest in uh, pursuing commitments. So it's not necessary between developed and developing uh, countries, but it's really what we're seeing is really a regional trend, like a regional blocks that are building. So I think countries like Singapore, Chile, the UK, Australia, will have a very important role in trying to create a bridge between these blocks, Japan as well. So these are very important countries and we, we rely on them to create bridges between these blocks that are um, coming up. Right. So interoperability between the blocks, we need the digital spaghetti to have the same sauce somehow. Uh, we'll yeah. see what we can do. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's open it up to uh, everybody. Uh, anybody who wants to Jump in on the conversation. Please just raise your hand and and say who you are, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, all right, go, uh, Martha. Hi. Yes. Uh, and apologies. I'm going to bring a topic that may or may not be relevant. So if it's not relevant, feel to to ignore. But I was wondering if part of these negotiations also includes satellite communications. And the only reason is because we know that China has increased tremendously the number of Leo and Geo satellites to the extent that they are combining it with artificial intelligence to get a tremendous amount of data worldwide. So I'm just kind of curious as to this is something that has been um, addressed within the context of these uh, negotiations. Satellites were definitely a big issue in the GATS context uh, years ago. I, in the more recent debates, I haven't heard a lot of focused discussion on this. Uh, any, any of you guys have a have the sense of this? I don't know the uh, international discussions, but I will note that we just saw SpaceX uh, announce a new division, uh, which is going to serve the U.S. military with spy satellites across the world. Um, every major country <laughs> is trying to put spy satellites in the in the air. Uh, so I'm not surprised that China is. Uh, using uh, these spy satellites and combining it with AI, as I'm sure the United States is as well. Yeah. Mira? And we, perhaps one sort of set of rules that can be relevant are the rules on cybersecurity, right? So um, not in a direct way, but certainly in an indirect way. And then as the, from the text of the JI, we also have a part on telecommunications. So um, that's going to be important for the telecommunication services and also making the reference paper applicable to all that. It's only partially sort of relevant for these networks, not so much for satellites, but it still is sort of a, a deeper market access commitment and sort of um, leveling the playing field in the telecommunication sector. We don't have this normally in digital trade uh, chapters of FTAs. Normally it's a separate part in the services sector uh, part of the treaty and now we see this a little bit merged here okay yeah well it, certainly in any event you know the, the, to martha's point all the discussions about data and how data is handled irrespective of whether there's bespoke language on satellite systems per se the the, the data language becomes relevant to, to what the chinese are doing as she was saying marty did you did you want to get, say something on this or no well, on satellites specifically, I don't know, but what I can say is that um, by looking at the regulations that countries are implementing, we see also more and more uh, regulations aiming at controlling um, the use of data in the context of uh, Internet of Things, uh, e-SIMs, and all of this. It's very complicated, the way in which also these policies are working and um, affecting trade. Uh, but definitely there is um, more interest by governments to control what's going on uh, using their the telecommunication sector. Um, yeah, so we do see new policies in this area. The European proposal in in the in the JSI has has always included language to revise the uh, telecom agreements from 1997, but I haven't seen 
that they specifically focused on the satellite aspect. There's a there's a question in the chat uh, saying uh, asking whether uh, from somebody named Wendy uh, asking whether someone would like to comment on why developing countries are adopting domestic privacy regulatory frameworks with developing country elements such as adequacy uh, and you know how uh, the spread. I mean privacy. Since, since the GDPR, privacy uh, rules are spreading globally. Uh, there, there's a lot of convergence among them. Um, a lot of countries are looking at the European model. Uh, how is this uh, impact in, in the trade context and so on? Anybody have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, that's part of this Brussels effect that we are, we are seeing, right? Um, uh, Anupam was talking about this, um, the EU being the sort of the major regulatory entrepreneur in the whole area of data governance. And we see this a lot of copy pasting of the GDPR across different countries. Um, I think it's more than 80 countries now have essentially the same sort of a model of the GDPR. Uh, and sometimes what is problematic from the digital trade perspective is that those very same countries may have entered into FTAs, into free trade agreements with substantial commitments on data flows, on data governance that are not necessarily uh, neatly reconciled with what they have adopted at home. So there must be, might be a sort of a, a, a clash in this regard. Hmm. Uh, maybe uh, if I can add something um, on on G on the effect of privacy, uh, perhaps I can say something about the empirical studies that we have conducted, um, because actually, um, like the team I work with, uh, we try to look at empirically the cost of this policy. So we have worked extensively on assessing how different types of regulations on personal data affect uh, trade. Um, and this is important uh, empirical evidence needed to justify also discussions in the WTO. And what we found is that um, when it comes to the GDPR-like model, uh, this is a model that on one hand um, creates costs for businesses, and it's not only us, there are many studies showing how uh, GDPR is costly, uh, especially for small companies, uh, because it's uh, very expensive to, to implement and to comply with. But uh, what we found at the global level is that the uh, increased trust uh, of consumers towards the internet, which is connected to a GDPR-like policy, is compensating the loss of trade steaming from the costs uh, of the conditions. So this is what we find globally. Uh, so generally, the GDPR does not seem to impact trade, uh, which is not what we expected orig originally, because we expected to have a negative effect of GDPR overall. Very interestingly, uh, we have a new study, which is not published yet, um, which is on Africa. What we did was to assess uh, 54 African countries and, and how uh, their personal data policies affect trade within Africa. And what we found are very different results in the sense that uh, a GDPR-like model for Africa has a clearly negative effect on intra-regional African trade. Um, so basically the conclusion of, of our research is that while overall globally GDPR is something that uh, um, does not seem to have a negative effect on trade and is actually creating trust, within Africa, copying and pasting something that comes from another context can create negative effects. And, and now we have empirical evidence to show this. Marty, is that report published? No, yet. Uh, we are about to publish a month or so. It will be out uh, with the African uh, Economic Research Center. Well, Would you mind just saying very quickly why? Why? Because uh, the cost of compliance with GDPR is something that developed uh, countries, uh, companies in developed countries can implement and deal with more easily. But in Africa, the cost that comes from complying is uh, cannot be compensated by the increased trust uh, of consumers in these countries. So... Uh, it's been a huge boon to lawyers in Brussels, right? The GDPR. I mean, every company has had to ramp up big compliance departments, and you know, there's consultancies everywhere. GDPR is a huge industry, but if you're in Africa, that might be a harder lift, right? Anna Penn. Sure. So the question is about the proliferation of adequacy rules across the world, um, and so, and one of the questions was why, uh, and so. Um, partly, I think it's because it is the cut and paste, as Mira described. So now, why is the cut? And, there, why is there this cut and paste? In part, because the adequacy system of the European Union um, 
uh, kind of encourages other countries to adopt similar laws um, and therefore it, adopt laws that impose adequacy. Now, the irony of all this is that the European Union now is being tested if these rules are implemented as to whether or not it is adequate uh, to protect privacy. Now, the European Union does not mm. test its own mm. country's uh, national surveillance laws for purposes uh, such as those in Schrems II. Uh, and so it's there's an open question whether the European Union actually satisfies the Schrems II standard. The US um, uh, Department of Justice uh, uh, decision and uh, and uh, U.S. government's decision, uh, uh, which was necessary in, in the context of the of the uh, uh, transborder data privacy framework, uh, is actually really odd. Um, in the reasoning is really very weak as to why the European uh, transfers of American data to European states actually provides all the protections that they have in the, you know, that they would have in the United States. Um, it relies upon the European Court of Human Rights fundamentally as the main source of protections for the European Union's data. I want to remind you that the, Russia was, until just a couple of years ago, a member of, the, also subject to the European Court of Human Rights judgments. Uh, so, which might tell you a little bit about the extent of which uh, the uh, it, it, that court's rulings are uh, have force um, across the uh, the European states. Um, so, anyway, there's a lot to ask about the proliferation of adequacy rules across the world. Um, Paul Schwartz and I have a paper uh, called Privacy and or Trade, which talks about this proliferation across the world. Right. Okay. There's a question in the chat from Cedric Amon asking uh, to us to go back to the uh, moratorium uh, issue for a second. And he'd like to hear more about uh, the strong opposition from Indonesia to the renewal of the moratorium. Uh, what is really the thinking? I mean, it's we, we talked a little bit about this, but I mean, to, to get a little bit deeper baby into the thinking of those who argue that the moratorium uh, is negative uh, in its impact for developing countries. I mean, how, how is this kind of thinking, what, what are the real intellectual rationales that, I mean, aside from just saying, well, it used to be that if you shipped uh, music in a CD, we could tax the CD, now we can't tax the CD. But I mean, the, the moratorium would extend far beyond that, right? It's not just on, on um, videos, it's not just on music, it's on any kind of electronic transact transmission. So what is the thinking? I mean, if you're talking about transmissions of it in, in the insurance or, you know, just individuals or bloggers or who knows, I mean, there's all kinds of data that could possibly be subject to duties. So how are they, how are they thinking about this? Are you guys tracking that discussion at all? Maybe I can start. I can't. I can't speak so much about Indonesia, but maybe about India. So uh, I mean, it all started really uh, with this study that was published by UNTAP in 2019, where it was shown that um, developing countries are losing money, and it's like in the amount of eight uh, billions, so a huge amount of money, having been deprived of this sort of digital tax or customs duty. But there are also other arguments that come on top that we haven't talked about. And one is about sort of this digital or data inequality in the sense that, you know, like uh, local uh, users and companies are becoming source of raw data for foreign companies that can, by using this data, also improve their services and basically become dominant on the market while at the same time, those countries would not have the possibility to develop their own um, digital economy startups because they would not have access to the data and also because, of course, they lack resources. So this argument of digital gap, digital data inequality is also coming in. I think with regard to uh, India, as Marty mentioned, it has a lot to do with, with sort of domestic politics and how they tailor their own uh, data governance system, basically that, you know, this people's data belongs to the government, but it can also be commercialized. So it's it's a very strange model. 
And India has also made quite a bad experience with the WTO uh, information technology agreement, that this zero tariff agreement that we have for uh, IT goods. Uh, they were part in the first edition in 1998. However, uh, actually through this agreement, which abolishes tariffs for IT goods, uh, India lost market share globally. So that become, uh, became a political argument that was very much used by, by domestic sort of constituencies to also to argue against uh, this involvement uh, in uh, digital trade, We're making, including uh, also custom, the customs digital model. That's an important linkage, yeah. Uh, Marty, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's the beauty of having empirical research in this area, because one thing is what emotionally you, you think, another thing is to check empirically what's going on. And India has made similar arguments in the past with ICT goods. Uh, India didn't sign up to the ITA expansion, but when you look at the uh, exports of ICT products uh, from India, you see that it's much lower than in China, for example, and this could be one of the explanations, uh, uh, given that they are implementing uh, higher tariffs on intermediate uh, goods. Um, and uh, when it comes to to uh, the, the the transmissions, I think the arguments is very similar in the sense that it's very simple to see that you are losing uh, tariffs uh, uh, revenue. It's just it's the immediate um, uh, reaction when you see um, when you see that uh, instead of goods you are importing uh, instead of uh, books you are importing ebooks instead of uh, papers you are uh, actually newspapers uh, well instead of not national newspapers you are uh, accessing newspapers online. Uh, but what's the UNCTAD study? did i think was a, a disservice in the sense that what it uh, did was to measure just the loss of tariff revenues without looking at the um, trickle down effects on the economy when it comes to consumers and and businesses uh, so if you merely look at the loss of, of tariff revenues of course you lose tariff revenues but by by losing tariff revenues you are also giving access to your companies to more efficient services that they can use uh, as we discussed uh, before um, so, yeah, I think that the, the study by IMF, WTO and all the others uh, is, is much more comprehensive and provides a better perspective. And that's why also countries, um, I think this is also the reason why countries now have extended the moratorium. Without this study, I don't know if they would have done it, um, because there is a clear empirical study showing um, having a more comprehensive perspective. And now developing country, countries are really thinking about uh, all, all the effects of implementing this uh, this tariff, um, and uh, just one last thing about Indonesia and what uh, what is the thinking uh, of Indonesia. Uh, they have this um, document in the WTO, one of uh, in, in which they they talked about the reasons and what they say is of course state revenue as one of the explanations, but also they clearly say that they need to support. Uh, local SMEs against uh, the, the unfair competition of foreign providers. Uh, so this is clearly the argumentation that these companies are coming in and offering their goods uh, and compared to brick and mortar um, shops, um, they they don't pay uh, their fair share of taxes. So that's the idea behind uh, the position of Indonesia. Yeah, I would just pick up on what you said, Marty. You know, I think for people who don't spend much time in Geneva, uh, it, it's worth noting how much impact on the thinking in developing country governments you get from the advice provided by UNCTAD, the South Center, and other kinds of groupings where you've got some folks who are sort of still <laughs> in the import substitution, you know, 1960s vision of how international trade works and you should just, you know, impose tariffs and, and that's going to make everything better without asking, how does that impact domestically, right? I mean, if if you raise costs for everybody, uh, uh, how does that impact your own domestic uh, users across the economy and in civil society, et cetera? There's, a, there's another, uh, Anapad, did you want to get on this or should I go to the next question? Import substitution is what we're doing with TikTok today. Right. Uh, so. yeah, there you go. So the, to come full circle, uh, there's a, there's a, another question in the, in the chat, but before I read, I just want to, point out to people that you're perfectly welcome and indeed encourage you to just raise your hand and come on screen and, and ask your questions as well. This is how we normally do things as Martha did. Um, Jen Brody uh, asked, uh, given USTR's policy reversal on cross-border data flows, do you have any countries in mind who could play an important role by stepping in to fill this void 
and promote uh, data flows. I mean, it's worth noting that the you know the uh, the facilitators, the drivers of the GSI discussions, Australia, um, God, now I'm blanking. Australia, Japan, Japan and, and Singapore. huh? Japan and Singapore. Singapore. Um, so there are other countries that are trying to step into the breach in terms of exercising some leadership in the discussions, but of course they can't drag everybody towards making strong commitments. Uh, any thoughts from any of you on that or filling the void of the left by the, the U.S. withdrawal from leadership? Maybe just, can, I mentioned already the role of Singapore. So um, Singapore is part of uh, all uh, digital economy agreements, uh, except for the one between Japan and the United States. And the scope of the provisions in this digital economy agreements has um, been extended over time uh, with the UK, Singapore, and the DIPA being the, the most uh, sort of advanced models that we have. Um, and they provide not only, you know, sort of commitments um, or in the digital economy, but also really a platform for cooperation on some of the emerging issues like uh, fintech and artificial intelligence. Um, so I think certainly those countries can take the lead. And sometimes there are quite nice studies that show that, you know, this small country cooperation can actually work very well. And it was indeed Singapore and Japan that um, in cooperation with New Zealand that saved the failed TPP. And, you know, it could be then adopted as this big mega regional now that the CPTPP is without the participation of the United States. Um, maybe... Yeah. Uh, just some thoughts. Uh, so as we were saying before, I think the role of these countries will be crucial. Uh, countries like Japan, Singapore, Australia, Chile in Latin America, UK in Europe, I think will be also very important. Uh, but none of these countries, even together, can play the role that the US had it's played in the past. So we're clearly going to see a lack of leadership uh, that we will miss. And if I can be a bit provocative, I think China pulled take uh, a very important role in the future. It will not be about taking uh, binding commitments, but at least to try to drive the discussion because they have now the offensive interest to do that. So they could play a bigger role and they're trying to uh, with the CPTPP request, uh, with uh, uh, what they're, they are approaching the GSI, they're approaching the la latest uh, ministerial conference. So I think maybe <laughs> we could see a bigger role uh, coming from. From that add to that, which is that there's a reason that China might be particularly interested, as Martina has said, their own interests here are uh, to ensure data flows. Um, the United States has, uh, the Biden administration has indicated that it's very concerned about Chinese cars entering the United States. Why? Not because of competition with American cars. Okay, that's not the uh, surface reason. The surface reason is because of data flows back to China. Uh, so data flows to China suddenly become the reason to keep Chinese cars out of the US markets. By the way, that now ex can expand to all sorts of goods. All your smart IoT goods have that feature with them. Uh, and so you could kick out all of these Chinese goods uh, in mass uh, and declare them to be uh, a threat to national security. By the way, United States sells a ton of cars in China. Uh, you know, our cars are also connected, uh, et cetera. So uh, China sells no cars in the United States. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, position because the, if China, China has a data localization obligation on connected cars, by the way, already. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a fascinating question. NVIDIA's AI chips are going to be in cars sold in China, though, so that's an interesting. The whole situation gets pretty blurry. Um, all right, well, look, uh, I, I think I'm not sure that we we got directly to Ellie's some how much does WTO actually matter question here, but I think we kind of came around it from different aspects. But um, I think we can we can move towards closure here. So I want to thank the panelists uh, for very interesting conversation. Uh, I want to also thank Jason Buckwhite, the executive director of CITI, for operating all the, the stuff behind the scenes. Uh, I want to remind you that, again, four weeks from today, we'll meet again to talk about the Global Digital Compact negotiations in the UN. And uh, let me turn back to Ellie for a closing thought. 
Uh, thank you. I I don't have closing thoughts. Just a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This uh, Bill's uh, uh, webinars are always really interesting and informative, and this one was within that kind of great set of webinars. Really, a kind of a wonderful one. Uh, and that uh, credit goes to our great speakers who were lively, uh, and uh, and and really kind of this was the first time, as Bill mentioned, that we had uh, three academics there, and you really did a great job to uh, uh, show that academics have a lot to say on this and can do so in a very nice, interesting, smart, and lively fashion. So, thank you for uh, your erudition and experience in this, and uh, thank you for informing us. I think we all go back from this uh, webinar. Uh, understanding some of the issues that are upon us, uh, no doubt they will be similar next year because this process is tend to, uh, the, the, the terms change, but the basic problems of national and global and regional and free and uh, protected and so on are, will be with us forever and ever. So thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us. And we will see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Everyone, bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye.